Hey, thanks so much for joining us for another episode of the Tree of Life Church podcast. It's our prayer that these messages help connect you to the life, love, and power of Jesus. And actually, in just getting ready for today, there's a lot of things that have been uh, just in my heart and my spirit and getting prepared for. And I'm asking God, because I'm kicking a series off next week, and I'm asking God, like, what is it, what is it that I can talk about? What can I, what can I bring to the church? And uh, just through listening things and listening to him, I just really felt uh, this morning, I want to get a message called, I'm just calling it Distracted. And just in our lives and in my life and how, how busy we've been and so many things are happening that it's easy to get distracted. And distraction is the enemy of discipleship. I want you to know that. And so there's only so much time that we have in our life, and, and the reality is that we spend so much, probably more than we should or could, just because of distraction. It can be innocently, it can be subtly, but yet we get swept up into the distractions of the day when we need to be really intentional and purposeful in what we're doing. And, and hopefully the family series is going to address some of that just from a family uh, uh, context. And we're looking forward to really bringing some things out to help you with your marriage, to help you with your kids and your family environment. Um, I want to start by saying this is a, a little bit different message. I'm just going to bring a lot of information. I want to set you up for the, the last part of the message this morning, but I also feel like it's important to talk about this in church. And so uh, let me start by this. 2007, in 2007 in January, Steve Jobs came out uh, for Apple and he had presented something that would change the world, the iPhone, the, the mobile device, and talked about all it could do and how it would better everybody, everyone's lives and how the advancement of technology, and it changed everything forever, and it, and it literally did. It changed all of us and, and forever, and technology keeps advancing at a faster rate, and the iPhone came out. But with something that's so great and so wonderful also comes some challenges, not just benefits, but challenges. And, and I want to use that as an example this morning. Uh, I'm not anti-iPhone. I, I, I have one. I use it all the time. Uh, but I want to say that probably for me, it can be one of my greatest distractions. And uh, I just want to share some things with you about that. And uh, I also want to talk about in the context of uh, the generation, uh, not that I'm in, I'm a little bit older, but the millennial generation. I don't know if you know this, but millennials, the millennial generation is the largest gener uh, generation, largest pe group of people in the history of, of mankind. And the millennial generation is uh, typically viewed as age 25 through age 40. How many millennials do we have in the house today, age 25 through age 40? All right, there's a lot more in second service, which I anticipated. Want to sleep a little, in a little bit, maybe a little later kind of thing. I get that. The older generation in first service. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and, uh, but a lot of millennials in the house today. And, and I think it's interesting to see one of the greatest advancements in technology come with the biggest generation. And what it's done, I think, together has created and spurred this kind of of, um, advancement of technology, creativity, innovation. And uh, I don't think it's by accident, perhaps, that that's the largest generation in the history of mankind, because I think the millennials and technology are key in bringing in the return of Jesus Christ. Because along with technology is our ability for the first time, we're able to see the reality of Jesus coming again, because the Bible says, all shall hear, and then the end shall come. And there's a lot of other things associated with what needs to happen in end time prophecy for the return of Christ. But we're seeing it being fulfilled so quick so quickly now, and with the advancement of technologies for the first time, there potentially is the opportunity or ability to get the gospel all over the world um, like, no, like no other time before. And in fact, my, when my wife and I were in Utah, I had to, we, had to, we were staying at the ranch with my daughter, but there wasn't very good internet there. So I had to check into a hotel like Monday, Tuesday, which would be 26th, 27th, because I had been asked to, be, uh, to speak on a, um, a broadcast through King's Television Network that was going to be broadcast to 182 nations. And so I needed good internet because I was going to be then in a hotel room in Utah with my iPad. <laughs> and this is what's amazing. My wife, had, my wife was there and she set the desk up and then she put a note, a, a, my notebook, my folder on top of it. It wasn't high enough. Then she put the Gideon Bible there and then she stacked the coffee pot laying on its side on top of that. And then my iPad and to get the right angle, if you will, the right picture. But in that hour's time, I was one of the speakers and it was literally out to millions of people over 182 countries that I got to share the gospel. And I thought, what other time could that happen? Amen, amen. I'm super excited, honored about that. When could that happen? When other time could that happen and be possible? In fact, in just the hour time that we spent and sharing the gospel and being able to give a, a, a salvation prayer and pray for the sick, the power of God, if you will, that I got a, a text after our broadcast was over from the gentleman who kind of heads it all up, and he said, look, love to have you on more. And he said that we had, in just our time, we had 30,000 responses for prayer requests and testimonies and salvation come in through their phone lines and through email. And I thought, 
We are living in a time like no other. We're living in a time like no other, really, literally. It was 182 countries. It was in Iran and Iraq and China and places that are close to the gospel. And it was just transcendent governments and borders. And in fact, coming up uh, the end of this month, uh, I was also asked to do uh, teach on a, for JBN Network, which is Central and South America, and they have the potential to be in 100 million homes. And so it's all in Spanish. And I said, you know, my Spanish is not so bueno. And uh, I said, and they said, that's okay. We have interpreters. And I said, that's okay. You know, I, I, I my, that's not my strong suit with interpreters. And and I said, but you know, my brother just so happens to pastor our sister church in Mexico, and he's fluent. And so on May 30th, he's going to get on a broadcast for JBN and share the gospel all over Central and South America. And I thought, wow, what a, what a time we're living in. What a time we're living in, the advancement of technology. But now with that, with all our advantages and benefits, also comes another side, comes disadvantages and challenges. And I think those things can become some of the greatest distractions from our discipleship. And the reality, as John Piper said, uh, John Piper is a great minister and a great author, in fact, and he said this, he goes, what, the end of life, we get to heaven, we won't look back and and say we didn't, uh, we can't say that we didn't have enough time for prayer. It won't be, it won't be a a lack of time that we we had, he said this way, we won't have been people with a lack of prayer because of a lack of time. And I would add to that, we won't be people of a lack of prayer or a lack of reading of the word because of a lack of time. And I hear that all the time. And myself, I'm looking at my time schedule. I'm like, well, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. Well, the reality is it's because we're engaging in some distractions that we really could probably put aside and direct our attention and time somewhere else. Now, I'm not knocking phones today. That's just the obvious to me illustration. And I'm certainly not anti that. But I want to give you some things concerning all that this morning that you might find interesting. Um, As I said, the millennial generation is the largest generation in the history of mankind. Half of the world's population is 30 years and, and younger 53%, fun fact, 53% of millennials would rather lose their sense of smell than their phone. (laughs) Except for people that that had COVID and lost their smell and taste. I'm not trading that away for anything. Listen to this. More people in the world own a mobile device than own a toothbrush. Yeah. And if you're sitting next to somebody like that one, say, thank God for masks, right? (laughs) It's like, right, right. We're living in a day and age where technology today uh, and the future can advance like never before. And I believe that, honestly, I believe the millennials are part of the generation that's going to really help usher that in. And I know there's generations to come, but we need to be really intentional, not just with, uh, that's why I'm talking about family dynamics and we're talking about investing in your teens and we're talking about investing in your kids. And that's why it's so important to be connected and get your kids and teens plugged in because not only is such danger in just the things that are available now through technology, but also it is, it is, a, it is a time stealer, a time consumer. We check our smartphone 81,000 times per year, to which someone say, oh, is that all? And uh, and I was like, I don't know, but once every 4.3 minutes of our life, we're on the average, we're we're checking our phone. During this service alone, you'll be tempted to check your cell phone 12 times. Well, depending on how engaging I may or may not be, I find people check it when there's topics we don't like, they'll check it more when we're talking about tithing or, you know, something like that. Some of you just hit your phone right now. I'm looking at you right now. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm on my phone. <laughs> on the average person, the average person spends five hours a day on social media, which amounts to five years and four months on, of your life on social media. Now, I realize that we, however, with our phones, important because we put calendars, to-do lists. We have all kinds of things there. I have podcasts I listen to, books I read. Uh, there's things like uh, pictures that we need, documents that we need, video that we need. I, I get that. A, a workout regimen, if you will, news, diets, uh, all kinds of things are found on our phone. I, I totally understand that. 54% of people check their smartphone within minutes of waking up. Many people check it before they get out of bed. of people sleep with the cell phone next to them. 73% check social media feeds before entering into any spiritual discipline in their life every day. And listen to this statistic. Teenagers spend an average of nine hours a day on social media, which amounts to 24 years of their life. You know, and it seems like it's getting more and more out of of control. I mean, we can be just bound to it. It's like bondage almost. We can be prisoners to it and it gets out of control in your life and you can become a prisoner to it. Maybe that's why it's called a cell phone. Come on, that's funny. Come on. Don't be sending me the emoji with the laughing face on that one. I want to hear live laughter, all right? 
<laughs> I don't care what you say, that was funny. All right. <laughs> and we can tune out real life and real people. We get bored with someone or something, we just go to our phone. 210 million people suffer from social media addiction. Now listen to this one, as a dad of two daughters, single young females are the most vulnerable group. Teens spending five hours a day on phones are 50% more likely to suffer from depression. I mean, I don't know that's where we're looking. When we're looking at things and causes and root causes of things, I'm not sure we're looking at the phone. 10% of teens check their phones all through the night. If one of the friends sends them something at 3 a.m. in the morning, they'll wake up and they hear the ding and they'll check their phone. Studies show that the more addicted you are to the phone, the more prone you are to suffer depression and anxiety and be less productive in school and or work. In fact, the phone, there's three distractions that keeps us from things, the digital distractions that can keep us from things like it keeps work away, keeps you from working. Studies being shown, are being shown uh, that there's hours being stolen from employers because of employees on phones. Some of you are employers and you have employees and you know exactly what we're talking about there. It keeps people away. Because the Bible says to love your neighbor, and love your neighbor is not just have this warm, fuzzy feeling for them, it's serving them. It's interacting with them. And you need to have time to talk with them, you need to have time to visit with them. And, and when we get our, phone out, more around, get our phone out more around other people, we're saying that you're not important and it devalues them. It keeps God away. Because God responds to us, or God is, is most known to us in those quiet moments, and we can't stand quiet anymore. We can't stand those moments. We, we, we get a little agitated, or we need, you know, something needs to happen. It's in those, but it's in those quiet times and quiet places, those moments, that we become more aware of God, and he's trying to say something to us. I heard a pastor say it this way, that we suffer from spiritual attention deficit disorder, which is S-A-D-D, which is sad. It can be a struggle for some in service. It can be a struggle. And we ask you, and I know this, listen, now, so why do you ask us to take a selfie and check in and send it to people? Because now all I'm going to do is keep checking and seeing how many likes I got on that one, right? It's like, you did this to us, right? And I know that, you know, we want to post things and it's important to do that. Don't get me wrong. I'm not smashing, bashing phones. It's important to post things and I, I praise and worship and all the things to so post all that. Please do. And, and here's what I know. It's interesting. Instead of people want to check their phone, I'm not checking my phone now but then they look at their watch, right? Is that, right? They kind of subtly kind of, kind of take a look at the watch, put the phone away. I'm putting the phone away, but they'll, something will happen and they'll look at their watch. But I'm not trying to get on anybody, but I, I want us to see that there's things around our life and everyday things that can steal time away and can be distractions from our discipleship. And the truth is we can all evaluate it a little bit more. In fact, I think we need to have more time away from our phone, if you will, more time that we set it aside whether it be dinners or activities or events. In fact, I'm talk when talking with the team and we're going to be looking at activities and things that we can do here to help facilitate that. Um, I, I think, you know, what a good thing would be fi finding time to fast some social media maybe. In fact, when we do fasting, and that's one of the things I fast. And one of the things I fast, and I just want to let you know or remind you or let you know if you don't know that we believe in the first fruit principle here. And so the first of every month, we spend the first Saturday of uh, every month praying first fruit prayer. Actually, we pray every Saturday, nine to 10, and we would invite you out to come pray every Saturday morning with us here from nine to 10. We pray for all kinds of things concerning the church, but we also pray for the services on Sunday morning. And so, but then the first Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of every month, which would be tomorrow, Tuesday, Wednesday, we ask, we ask our congregation at will and our staff to fast something, to engage in fasting. I think probably that first fruits fasting time would be a great time to maybe fast some social media or something that would not be so much of a distraction, at least in that intentional time. And I believe you'll see a positive result from that. And sometimes we hear it ring or buzz or vibrate, and that's all we hear. But what we really need to do is hear him. We need to hear God. We need to hear God first and God's voice. And so I want to talk about understanding the power of distraction. And again, your mobile devices, mine, they're not bad. Money's not bad. It's how you use it. And so it can be a blessing for sure. We already talked about propagating the gospel and so many other ways to do that, but it also can be a challenge to you and a distraction. Because the reality is, it's easier to post than pray. I'm going to tell you, posting does not take the place of prayer. It's easier to Snapchat with someone who would benefit more from your smile your hug, your laugh, your shoulder to cry on, your attention or your affection. It's easier. It's easier to Facebook than to put your face in the book and read it. That's just the truth and reality of it. You know, the Bible talks about redeeming the time. 
in Ephesians 5. You can look it up, read it. I don't have that in your notes, but it talks about redeeming the time. The ESV version, English Standard Version says, make the best use of the time. And I just think we need to get to a place to reevaluate that. And I felt it was important to do that today, maybe set us up for the upcoming series. We're talking about family and marriage and those things and leading into all the things we have for you for the summer. We need to be careful about distraction because here's what I want you to know. If you get anything from today, take this away. The devil loves distraction because distraction is the enemy of discipleship. You have time. You have time for discipleship. But the enemy is trying to distract you at times. And if you aren't engaged in discipleship tomorrow, and, this, and listen, this isn't just discipleship on Sunday morning. It's an all count Sunday morning. We're talking about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday as well. And the enemy knows nothing better than to distract you from your prayer time and from your time in the word. In fact, there's a challenge I want to challenge you with. I know a pastor that uh, created a challenge. I don't know if he actually created it, but I heard it from him. It's take 15 minutes every morning. Get up 15 minutes early in your morning and spend five minutes in the word, spend five minutes in prayer, and spend five minutes in worship and see what it does to your day, to your life. 15 minutes every day. Get up in the morning. I just told you how, long, how much time we spend on social media. Not even talking about your phone, just using your phone for business or life, but social media. And distraction is, a, a, is the enemy of your growth and your discipleship. And what I want to say is don't miss the real world around you. Real, real world, real life is happening around about you and distraction keeps you away from it. And the truth is we weren't made, we weren't made for isolation. We were not made for separation. And that can happen easily. And we, we want to look back and talk about isolation from pandemic. And there's a lot of that. I don't believe everybody's starting to come back and stuff, all that kind of stuff. But listen, isolation started long before the pandemic. It started in 2007 in this context. And so that just kind of, just kind of put it up at a bigger scale, magnified it. The truth is we weren't made for isolation and separation. We were made for each other. We're made for relationship with one another and connecting. God didn't wire us to be isolated and God didn't wire us to be fake. And because he didn't wire us that way, we struggle so much. That's why there's a lot of mental health that comes from there's a lot of depression or anxiety that comes from that. Now, I know it's a different message today and please don't hear me smashing social media or, or iPhones. There's a lot of positive to it. There's a lot of benefits from it, but we need to be aware of the distraction that can come as well. We weren't created, and we weren't created for the emotional roller coaster ride that the phone brings us, much less our teens or our kids. I mean, we're reprogrammed. We're being reprogrammed to go against how God created us. God created us to be emotional people for a reason. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about here. Emojis, we love emojis. I can have a whole conversation in emojis. I think it's fun. But, but maybe God wanted me to study this today to bring it to me. I've been convicted in studying this out. So here's what happens. Someone tells you that their, their grandma just died, and instead of calling them and checking on them and praying uh, peace in their heart and their life, here's what we do. Here's what we send them. And we're, we're, we're being distracted by replacing emotion with emojis. And we're losing something when we do that on our end and on their end. Now, I'm okay with sending that, but then I hope that you followed up with a phone call or something to say, hey, I don't know what to say. I know you had a loss, but I love you. They need to hear you say it. Now, it doesn't even work. It doesn't make it any better if you add a heart to that. <laughs> okay, Pastor, I hear you, so I'm going to add a heart to my sad crying face. I'll just add a heart. I don't know I love them. No, that's not what I'm talking about here. We've been distracted from, the, from real life and from engaging with people and our emotional involvement with other people. And so what if someone tells you that they're not feeling good? Here's what we do. I'm not feeling good today. Here's what we do. <laughs> but here's the thing. You may pray for them. But let's just be quite honest, that's our prayer. It's not that we drop to our knees in that moment. Now, some of us do, I, and I'd like to say I do. But here's the funny thing this morning, I got talking about Rama earlier this morning, I got a text from Pastor Hagen, and he just says, have, hey, have a great service, and God's so good, and all that. And then he said, and uh, Lynette and I are leaving tonight to fly out to Michigan. We're going to be doing some cra- crusades, pray for us. And you know what I did? I sent him the praying hands back. <laughs> I did. I was sitting right there before service started, first service, and all of a sudden I got convicted. I'm like, what are you doing? I'm going to be talking about this. So then I followed it up with like, Pastor Hagen, I'm going to praying for you. I, I know God's going to give you strength and you're going to walk in the anointing and lives are going to be changed. And I want you to know I love you. And cause I was convicted because all I sent was the praying hands and I was convicted. I had to, fo- I'm preaching to me, if anybody, so I had to follow it up, follow it up with, you know, just an encouragement, encouraging word. We're, we're, we're trading, we're trading our emotions for emojis for emotional involvement. The truth is a lot of people will send that, but 
they never really get to the prayer point. And then I want to add this one. I wonder, I wonder sometimes if people out there, they're hearing something like the worship is good or the preaching is good or whatever, whatever the evaluation, it's all subjective. And sometimes what we'll do if we really liked it or we thought the Holy Spirit was really present, here's what we'll do. We'll send this one. <laughs> it was on fire. It was lit. That was lit. And can I tell you that that does not represent the Holy Ghost fire falling on a place and changing lives where you've been in a service where heaven is open and the Holy Ghost and fire fell and you felt like fire was shut up in your bones and the music started picking up pace and started getting louder, right? And now you're starting to feel it and you feel the Holy Ghost goosebumps on you and you can hardly stay in your seat. It's all you can do to keep from getting up and running a lap. And can I tell you, if that's okay, just don't run into anybody. And if you do, we'll pray for him to be healed. But listen, that does not replace the power and presence of the Holy Spirit falling on your life. <laughs> and so if you like this message today, don't you dare send me that little fire thing. <laughs> We're replacing. We're being reprogrammed. We're replacing our emotions and things. We're getting distracted from what God really, really wants to do. And I want to say this, I, I love technology. I'm not, I'm not knocking it. I love it. I just told you about the 182. Car. I'm looking to do more. So how, how can Tree Life do more to reach people around the world? I love that we have an online audience. In fact, every week we have more people getting online with us and the numbers, hundreds and thousands of people are watching and maybe not today live, but they'll go back and watch. And I love all that. But can I say, if you're living here in the area, that does not replace an in-person experience. It doesn't. And I know... Listen, and I'm, I'm a, I was a little cautious in even saying that. I know that there's somebody that just can't. I mean, you might live with places where there's not a local church. If you're not feeling good, stay home. If you're in a really high risk category, not feeling comfortable, I, I get all that. But the reality is, there's some people that are just staying home. And you're probably never going to come now, but I need to tell you the truth. And you don't have to come here, but you need to go somewhere. You don't have to come to Tree Life Church, but you need to get a life giving church. It's not the same. It's not the same. Don't get distracted with thinking that an at-home online experience is the same as coming in. God said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. The power and the anointing comes when we come corporately. If you're still laying out at home and you don't have a reason to, no justification, then get here. Get here. And I know, and I'm going to say this because I've already dove into that right now. <laughs> I'm going to lose half my online audience after this comment. I, I want to... I want to say this. I, I know that what we want to say is, well, God will meet me where I'm at. If you're able to be here and you just choose not, I, I, don't, I don't know because I know what he wants. He wants you here. And so I just want to encourage you. I don't mean that to be a hard statement, but I, I got to tell you the truth in love. And don't be distracted and replace technology with what God wants to do in person. And so I just said, before first service started, a gentleman came up to me and he hasn't been in a, a long time, I think a year. And he says, man, I'm just so glad to be back here. I'm so glad that we're here in person again. I just missed it so much. And there's a reason why. And so again, I know that there's reasons why that you need to be at home, or maybe you're not in a place where there is a life-giving church and we can help you find one. But listen, it's not the same. I believe there's power in coming together. The Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together. And I think it's important for us to understand, don't get distracted because of technology. We need that connection. We need a place to belong. We need a family. What psychologists are saying is with emojis, and we're trading emojis for our emotions, and we're seeing what we see on our feed and stuff. We see something really sad. You're like, you'll get on your phone and say, wow, that's really sad. I, I, didn't, that's, I can't believe that. Or you'll see something that the next moment, the next thing that you see is something that just makes you laugh because it's a funny, silly meme or picture. And the next thing that you see makes you angry and upset. And, and, and what psychologists are saying now, we go from one moment, one moment, one moment, sad, happy, angry. What we're doing is ultimately we're desensitizing our emotions completely. And now our emotions are being confused and we don't even know how to feel and how to respond or we're desensitizing our emotions where we're putting up walls and just completely shutting down and we don't even realize it and we wonder why we have some of the problems that we have today. And it's, it's not like those things are bad. It's like if you got it out of priority and you got it out of order, then it becomes bad. If it's a distraction, it'll keep you from discipleship. And it's important to get things in the proper order. Don't be distracted. We need to understand that because, again, it creates this distraction away. We, cannot, we can no longer say, I didn't pray because I didn't have time, or I didn't read my word because I didn't have time, or I didn't take worship because I didn't have time. You just put that time somewhere else. That's just the truth. And no, and no judgment here. Me too. 
And we need to make sure that we reorder all that. So Matthew 12, 36, are you going to give us a scripture today? Absolutely, I am. We don't leave this place without the word. Matthew 12, 36 through 37. But I say to you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. Okay, we wanted a scripture, but you have to give us that one? (laughs) For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Every idle word. Can I tell you, every idle tweet? Every idle post? And I'm amazed at how bold people get when they can hide behind a screen. But you realize there may not be any repercussions here anyway, but God knows. And you will be held to account for that. And I don't mean to be hard on that. That's just truth and reality. And myself have been convicted. But I'm amazed at some Christians and what they say and how they can be so mean or judgmental or whatever on that. I'm thankful and I don't always follow it, but I'm thankful that when I want to, hey, there's some things I want to say, but the Holy Spirit convicts me before I do it mostly, mostly, (laughs) mostly. And And I just think it's important to understand that we will stand before God one day. We will. Maybe not people or what, but we will stand before God one day and be held to account for every word that we said or wrote there. And it's important for us to understand that we will give account. Uh, Luke 10, 38 through 42, here's a story where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And they're now having a celebration dinner at Lazarus' house. Uh, a lot of people are there. His sisters, Mary and Martha, are there. Jesus is the guest of honor. And they come in to sit down and have a meal. And now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted. Martha was distracted with much serving. She put a higher priority or gave her time and attention to something else, even if it seemed good. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. But the Lord answered her. Jesus said, Martha, Martha, You are anxious and troubled about many things. There's many things you're being distracted with right now, but there's only one thing that's important, one thing that's necessary in this moment, and Mary has chose the good portion. He said the most important thing is Jesus. And we get distracted with so many other things and good things even, but I'm doing this and I'm serving here and I'm at the church here and I'm doing in this group and I'm all this guy. That's great. But listen, the main thing needs to always be the main thing. Jesus is the good portion and you choose every day the good portion or not. You choose to be distracted or you choose to give your time to the good portion, which will not be taken away from her, the good portion. We need to focus on and choose the good portion. Portion. Choose the good portion. Are you going to fill your soul with that which is eternal or that which is entertainment? So you choose daily the good portion. Choose the good portion. Distraction is the enemy of discipleship. I didn't put this in your note, but notes, but Jesus was teaching the parable of the sower sowing seed, seed being sown. And he talked about it falling on four different kinds of ground. Birds came to steal some away on one type of ground. Thorns grew and choked out the seed on another type of ground. And there was a ground that was hard. The sun came and burned it up. That is three out of four grounds. There was distractions or other things working against the seed. And then the seed also fell on the soil of the heart, which is good soil. So understand what Jesus was saying is 75% of seed sown or the word is stolen by distraction. 25% of seed sown finds good ground. We need to focus on the good portion because there's so many distractions out there trying to steal the word and the seed out of our life, away from us. And so we can't be caught up in the distractions. Distractions will begin to steal the seeds of God's power and purpose and destiny in your life. Don't get distracted because you need his seed. You need his power. You need his favor. You need his joy. You need his direction in your life. So decide every day, it's going to be a distraction or is it going to be a seed in your life? Decide every day. Choose the good portion. We can live by the seed or we can live by the screen. Build your life on the seed. Discipleship happens best, I want to say, in the context of community and people. It's possible through social media to have the illusion of relationships, but not the demands of companionship. And we need the demands of companionship in our life. Why is that? Because iron sharpens iron? Because two are better than one? Because if one falls, there's another to pick them up? 
But see, we come through, we, we keep spending time here, we have an illusion of relationship, and, and, and studies have shown, psychologists are saying that you can be liked but lonely. You can have all the likes in the world that you want but be lonely. Because you can live in an illusion, and it's what it creates if you live there, you can live in an illusion of relationship but suffer because you don't have the demand of companionship. And we were built for each other. We were built for companionship. And what happens is we trade real. We trade real right now moments for past moments of someone else's life. We trade away our real right now moment for past moments of someone else's life. You have a real family. You have real friends. You have a real purpose. You have real people. And you have to choose, am I going to trade my real right now moments in my life for the past moments of someone else's? You need to live your real life right now. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says this. We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with someone who commends themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves. They are not wise. In other words, the Bible says it's foolish to measure your life, your real life, with someone else's fake life. It's foolish to measure or compare your life with someone else who's consumed with their own life and wants to present the best part of their life. You know what? They, people, we present the best part of, of our lives. You don't know how many times that family had to take that picture to get just the right one. Right? You know what I'm saying, right? I mean, everything has to work. I'm not just talking about little kids. I don't know how many times we take pictures of family pictures because just something's not right. So we're basing our life and evaluating our real life compared to somebody else's fake life. And we just get caught in that. What is it? It's a distraction from keeping you from your real life. Somebody else's fake life is keeping you from your real life, and you choose whether to give that time or attention. In fact, there's apps. It's funny. I heard about these apps today. Like uh, you can you can be looking at someone's feed, and they can they can send you a picture. They just spent their anniversary on the beach in Hawaii. They never really went there, but you can find an app that'll put you and your spouse on the beach in Hawaii, and you'll be looking at like. And your husband just took you not to the beach in Hawaii. He just took you to Rockport. <laughs> Right? There's apps that you can find yourself at a nice restaurant, perhaps at the river, on my anniversary dinner at the river, river walk, and your husband just took you to Sizzler. <laughs> Real story, I was at Sizzler for my anniversary on Monday night, <laughs> just in Utah there. Just kind of worked out that way, you know, just kind of worked out. We were doing stuff with Cali, but. It doesn't matter. We're, we're measuring our real life to somebody else's fake life. And I thought it was something funny. I'm actually on a Thursday of this week, I will be speaking. I've been asked to be a guest speaker on a webinar with a significant church network. And so they're sending out the information that that's me. And I'm like, who is that guy right there? Who is that? That's 10 years ago. Where did they ever find that picture? I mean, he's handsome, but that's an old picture. I mean, we wouldn't want that on there. Where does that come from? That, people are going to get on the webinar and like, well, where's the other guy that was on the picture? Who's this guy? Where'd you find him? Did he? not show up? What happened to him? But I thought, well, it could be worse. Or so I, get, I get confused with this other guy. I get mistaken for this other guy all the time. I guess it could be this one there. And uh, you know, I got <laughs> Drew Carey. I, I don't know. So I'm going to tell the team this week, let's send them a real picture. People need to know the real me. So I'm going to send this one right here. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. There you go. I'm just trying to be real. <laughs> But that's the world we're measuring our life by. It's a distraction from who we really are. Who's we really are? John 12, 42 says this. Nevertheless, oh, let me give you a, a, a what leading up context to this. So Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead and big celebration at the house. People have seen Lazarus. Now he's headed in Jerusalem for his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Soon he would come and be crucified. And so people that had seen Lazarus, knew of the miracle, went before him and were talking to the crowd. So a huge crowd gathered and they're celebrating and shouting, Hosanna, and they're putting palm leaves down. And so many people are just shouting to Jesus and there to greet him. And then here we have this in the same story. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. But listen to this, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue. They were more concerned about man. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. They loved the praise of men more. Don't be so concerned about everybody else and everybody else's life. Don't be afraid what people are going to think. 
Don't get distracted by all that. Don't get distracted by it looks what it looks like for somebody else. You just focus on you because distraction is the enemy of discipleship. They love the praise of men more than the praise of God. Sometimes if you follow Jesus, the world will unfollow you. You have to decide. Do you love the praise of people and culture more than the praise of God? Sometimes you have to decide to be a friend of Jesus, even though the world will unfriend you. And we see that more and more. It's being attacked more and more today, is it not? But we got to love the praise of God more than the praise of man. Don't be distracted by the praise of man. It's not worth it. We need to live for the praise of God, not for the praise of likes or hearts or followers. Do you ever take a stand for Jesus? Do you ever take a stand for what's right, no matter what it costs you? Matthew 16, 24 through 25, closing with this scripture. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. You will save it. Don't get distracted by the other things in the, in the world that's happening around about you. Don't seek the praise of men or care what other people think. Seek God. That's where life really is. We're getting distracted by so many other people's fake life or other things happening in life. We're missing the life more abundantly that God has for us. So daily, pick up your cross and follow him. Daily, choose the good portion. And daily, live for the praise of God and not the praise of man. Because distraction is the enemy of discipleship. So let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. In just a moment, we're going to receive communion. But before we do, we need to give everyone a chance to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So if you're in here with us this morning or you're watching online, wherever you are, I want to ask you if you can remember a moment in time where you've invited, intentionally, purposely invited Jesus Christ in to be your Lord and Savior. If not, then today's the day for you. See, we need to do what Jesus said, take up our cross and follow him. We need to lose our life and in a sense, give our life to him and really find life or his life. There's a divine exchange that happens when we invite Jesus in. He takes our sin. He takes our guilt. He takes our shame. And he paid the price with his sacrifice. And then he gives us his life, life of fullness, the life that he has. And he gives us life and the ability to walk out life with him in victory and in peace and in joy. Thanks again for joining us this week. We pray that this message encouraged and inspired you. If you want to find out how you can be a part of Tree of Life, just go to our website, treeoflifechurch.org. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and share it with a friend. 